Hello, my name is Mark Layton and I am the founder of Platinum Edge, an organizational improvement company. And today I'm going to be talking to you about racing in reverse, the quantitative relationship between overtime defects and project slippage. One of the things that we happen to know is that people are working a lot of overtime. And in fact, the average US worker works about 45 hours per week. 66% of us do not feel as if we have good work-life balance. And the issue is, is that if you're lucky enough to get promoted, that situation will only get worse. Stress and overtime increase as a person is promoted through an organization. But overtime is not effective. And in fact, all the way back in 1908, Dr. Ernest Abe quantified that reducing daily work hours from 12 hours a day to eight hours a day actually increased cumulative output. And the reason why is as you move into those overtime hours, you're going to get fatigued and you're going to get slower. And in fact, an eight hour day produces somewhere between 16 and 20% higher cumulative output than nine hour days. And that quantification gets even worse as overtime increases. And the reason why is fairly simple. Um, output is a factor of a couple of things. It is uh, baseline output times the duration of time uh, that you happen to be doing that activity. What a lot of organizations do is they say, well, we would like to increase our cumulative output. And the way that we'll go about it is simply by uh, overworking our people. We'll increase the duration of time in which they're working on the activity, and that will increase our output. And what they fail to realize is that um, as you increase the duration of time that somebody does something, you will decrease their baseline productivity. And the reason why is because overworked people, they're slower. Um, now, when we talk about fatigue and the things that impact uh, our ability to be productive, we have a couple of types of fatigue. One type of fatigue is called simple fatigue, and simple fatigue happens when you've had a long day. Now, if you have simple fatigue, the product that you produce during those overtime hours, it will be degraded. Uh, you'll be slower at it, uh, you're going to produce more errors, so on and so forth. We have another dynamic, and it is called accumulative fatigue. And accumulative fatigue happens when you've had a long week. Um, and if you have uh, accumulative fatigue, you are going to impact every minute of your day. And the reason why is you haven't even recovered from yesterday, and you're already back at it today. They've done some studies on this, and they have shown working as little as 50 hours per week. I'm not talking iBank or 100-hour work weeks here working as little as 50 hours per week. By the fifth week, that your cumulative output is lower working 50 hours per week than it would have been if you would have simply worked 40 hours per week. And that is because of this accumulative fatigue and the creeping in of the degradation of your performance and your quality. Uh, the other problem associated with working overtime is that people are sleep deprived. Now, keep in mind, home responsibilities and social needs, they don't just miraculously go away because you're working overtime, right? Your children don't suddenly decide that they don't need a bath because you're working overtime. Uh, your friends probably don't decide that they don't ever want to see you again unless you're working a lot of overtime for a long period of time, and then you probably do have a pruning of some friendships. But, um, you know, for the most part, those needs are going to continue to exist. And so when we talk about overtime, and we we wonder, well, where does this time come from? The answer is it comes from your sleep. And that's very problematic. And the reason why is sleeping between four and six hours per night uh, for 14 straight nights, it has actually the same job performance degradation as if you had been awake for three days. The difference is that if you do this, and many of us do, that uh, your awareness of that job performance degradation goes away. And that's because the degradation in your performance has been slow enough that you just keep resetting your own expectations about what good performance is. And so your performance is terrible, uh, and you think it's amazing. Uh, and what that also means is that as you're sleep deprived is that you're going to make more mistakes. Um, now, keep in mind that for every hour of overtime that a seven person development team works, they will introduce approximately 10 defects into a system that they are working on. Uh, after about four hours, that ratio doubles. Uh, and now for every hour of overtime that they are working, they will introduce approximately 20 uh, new defects into their system itself. Now, imagine if I came to you and I said, I can tell you a way of being able to reduce your defects by 93% while increasing your uh, time to market, and it won't cost you anything. Would you be interested in that? Most organizations would say, of course, uh, of course we'd be interested in that. Well, I've got that solution for you, and it is simply stop overworking your people.
Now, do keep in mind, when we talk about defect correction, which in software is usually referred to as the quote-unquote QA phase, um, this is actually all being done in lieu of feature creation. So there is zero value add happening in the QA phase. You are simply going back and correcting all of the progress that you've erroneously taken uh, credit for earlier in the development phase. Keep in mind that the development phase and the QA phase, um, those are often... Um, equivalent from a duration perspective. Not in project planning, right? Everybody's optimistic uh, about how long the QA phase is going to take during project planning. And as you become late in your earlier uh, phases of a project, you become even more optimistic about how um, short the QA phase can be. So not in project planning, but in post-project metrics. The development phase and the QA phase are equivalent. So again, here's an opportunity to double the productivity of your organization. And the reason why is because defects take a while to correct. Um, now, correcting a defect is going to be somewhere between 6.5 and 100 times um, the expense and the time that it is to be able to correct it. And if you want to know what that is explicitly, um, if you find a defect while you are in the moment, so through test-driven development, through pair programming, uh, you're already mentally mobilized, you're already looking at the code, you're in the moment, it's about a 1x to fix that defect. Um, if you uh, commit that code into a build and it gets picked up through uh, automated testing scripts um, and a bug report is generated, now it goes out to the world, you have to re-mentally mobilize about where you were with that code, um, so on and so forth. It's about a 6.5x because now you've got a longer period of time to mentally mobilize. You've got to find it in the code, but for the most part, you probably know where it's at. If it becomes an escape defect, and what I mean by that is it actually goes out to the production environment and it comes back to the people who originally did that code, you're looking at about a 15x. And the reason why is several days or weeks have gone by, your uh, mental mobilization time is going to be much longer. Uh, but again, you did the code, you probably have a general idea of where it's going to be. If it becomes an escape defect and it goes to a production support team, so people who did not originally do that code, it is a 100x. And the reason why is they have no idea where in the application this defect happens to be. The first thing they have to do is they have to go find it. And now that they have found it, they can do the development necessary to correct that defect. And do you want to know what they better hope? They better hope that their correction to that defect doesn't cause another defect. For every two defects that are corrected, one new defect gets introduced. Um, and this is assuming that it can be corrected at all. Now, my own background is a military background. I spent 11 years in the Air Force. And one of the things that the Air Force just loves to do is they love to do sleep deprivation. They love to keep you up for a couple of days and see whether you're able to maintain uh, mission readiness. And this is a very interesting study that was done by the Walter Reed Institute in which they found that uh, after about 24 hours of wakefulness, that divisions of the 82nd Airborne, they were able to continue doing what their uh, primary job was. They were able to continue to fire their artillery. The problem is, is that they stopped being able to recognize the difference between enemy targets and friendly hospitals. Now, I want you to think about this in a real world context because we're dealing with this right now, today. So you might ask, well, then why is overtime used, right? If we know quantitatively that it's not effective, so then why is it that we use it? And the reason that we find that people tend to use it is a fewfold. Uh, the first is that it's a cultural value system, right? Uh, we love the Superman. We love the person who stays up for three days and gets the application through the goal line so that we can launch it on time. We celebrate that dynamic rather than criticizing the environment that caused that uh, you know, Superman heroics in the first place. So one of the problems that we, I think that we have is that um, people People just value these sort of heroics, right? It's the opportunity to play that role. Uh, and the other one is that loyalty and grit are basically established by sacrificing your personal life. You wanna know how I got where I am today? 20 years of grinding it, right? Uh, 10 hour, 12 hour, 14 hour days. I did that for 20 years and you know what? You're gonna do it too. Um, and so it's a real problem that we have with uh, people just valuing this personal sacrifice, this um, idea that I have given my health, literally in many cases, to the organization itself. Our compensation is also skewed towards valuing duration over productivity. In fact, many people are, um, you know, they bill by the hour. 
not by the productive uh, output, right, but by the hour. And, and when you realize that you're being incentivized not to be efficient, but to be long in duration, it actually changes how you even approach uh, you know, the problems themselves. There's also this huge problem that we have where, um, you know, there is a disconnect between development and uh, QA itself. Now, I talked about the QA phase oftentimes being equivalent to the development phase, uh, but the truth is there's a disconnect between those things. And in many organizations, people are credited twice for the same amount of work. In the development phase, you're producing something. It's trash, but you're producing something and you get credit for it. And then in the uh, QA phase, you go in and you fix all of the messes that you did through the shortcuts and other things that you were never given the time to sort of think through, and you're given credit for that as well. And so, um, you know, one of the uh, core benefits of being able to have a, pro a process in which you reduce the time between um, product creation and uh, the QA phase is that the progress that you make is real progress. It's not this faux progress of, I'm now gonna need an equivalent amount of time to fix what I created in the first place. So you might ask, all right, well, how do we prevent these problems? Um, and uh, I wanna make sure that you guys understand. Your organization, it is perfectly engineered to get the results that you are getting today. Um, if you'd like to get results that are different than what you are getting today, you are going to have to change things. Um, and there are a few ways that we do this. One of the best ways to be able to change the organization um, is to increase the visibility of performance. Now, I want you to understand that visibility and performance, they are always directly proportional. Um, sometimes this is called observational effect uh, or occasionally a Hawthorne effect because of a famous study that was done on this dynamic. As you increase visibility, you will increase performance. Um, the best way to do this under an IT space or any product development space is simply to close the gap between uh, defect introduction and defect identification. Now, our expertise happens to be in agile techniques, right? Uh, I'm a certified scrum trainer and my organization works with organizations to help them implement these types of agile techniques. And to be honest, agile techniques are one of the best ways to reduce product creation uh, from defect identification. And the reason why is because one of the first things that you're gonna do under an agile approach is you're gonna test your product, right? Test-driven development. You're gonna write a test, um, you're gonna make sure that that test fa uh, fails. You're then gonna do enough uh, coding so that you can get that test to pass. And now you're gonna refactor it. And under refactoring, what we're talking about is how much of my code can I remove from this function and still have it work? So now I know I've got a nice tight piece of code um, that is going to be stable and is going to work. Under an agile approach, you have uh, much more rapid um, learning uh, loops, right? Feedback loops are much more rapid. And, and this sort of informed learning is really the, the premise of an agile approach. Not only in making sure that the code that you're developing is good code, right? That the product that you're developing is of high quality, but whether that product is even valued by the marketplace itself. Um, you know, all throughout the day, you're gonna be getting peer level feedback. And that's through things like test driven development and pair programming, we talked about that. All throughout the uh, uh, iteration box, if you're running a sprint model, you're going to be getting customer representative feedback. And that's through a role which is called the product owner role. So pretty much every day of the sprint, you're going to know, is the product that we've produced, is it the product that my customer representative is looking for? At the end of every single sprint, which is going to be an iteration length of somewhere between one and four weeks, with four weeks really becoming a rarity now, uh, one week becoming much more popular. Although I'll tell you, we work iteration lengths that are as little as one day. But at the end of every single one of those sprint iteration cycles, you're gonna showcase what is now this working product that has been accepted by your customer representative to your internal stakeholders. It's called a sprint review meeting. And again, now I'm going to know, as an organization, we feel like this is product that is going to be valuable for our end customers. And then every single release, the rubber hits the road and you're gonna get feedback from the end customer. And now you're going to know, is what we produced, what the marketplace is looking for in reality. When we talk about uh, agile techniques, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about reality-driven development rather than faith-driven development. Under a traditional model, you sit down with a bunch of ideas that sound like they're a, a good idea, and then you just have faith that the marketplace is going to see the world the way that you see it. You plow all of your money into the product development itself, and then at the very end, ta-da, there's this great product according to me. 
But under an agile approach, we're going to validate that um, all throughout the project itself. And so you get uh, validated learnings much earlier, much cheaper. So the question you're probably asking is, well, then how can we accelerate projects? And you know, there are basically a, a couple of ways that we look at doing this, right? The first thing is work on the right thing. You know, one of the things that we happen to know from Standards Group is that about 64% of features that are developed using a traditional waterfall approach are used rarely or never. Um, now, if you looked into your own lives, you can see examples of this all over the place. Uh, think about a, a great product like Microsoft Office, right? Um, there are 4,000 features in Microsoft Office. How many of them do you use? Um, it's actually, it's a true uh, Pareto's law. About 20% of features uh, are used always or often. It's the reason that we want to do the project in the first place. About 16% are used sometimes, and a whopping 64% are used rarely or never. As in, I didn't know the product had this feature, and if I did know it had this feature, I wouldn't use it anyways. You know, when we go to organizations and we talk about agile techniques, one of the things that we'll talk about are our successes in bringing, you know, 30 to 70% cost saving to organizations. And many times our clients will be skeptical, and they'll say, 70% cost savings? It's impossible. How could you ever achieve it? But it's not impossible when I start off by not doing the 64% of features that your customers aren't going to use anyways. Uh, reduce wasted time. And when we look at uh, wasted time, there are a few things that sort of drive it. Uh, the first one is interruptions. Probably the, the biggest one is interruptions. You know, one of the things that we happen to know is in the IT space, uh, it takes a developer about 15 minutes to get to the right level of concentration to where they're doing effective code. It's called being in the zone. And once they're in the zone, an interruption as little as 2.9 seconds will reset this. And now they've got to go through the entire process again. An interruption as little as 4.4 seconds will now triple the number of errors that are made on a sequencing task. And just so that you know, programming is a uh, sequencing task. 4.4 seconds. Hey, how, did you see the game last night? Yeah, I saw it. It was great. What did you think of that final score? Amazing. Great. Uh, good luck. Uh, another 15 minutes to get to the next level of concentration, or you're about to triple the amount of defects you're having on the thing you're working on right now. It's that quick. Thrashing, uh, you know, we know that there'll be a 30% performance increase simply by allowing people to uh, be dedicated and focus on the thing that they're doing. And the reason why is that Microsoft actually started this uh, study about uh, 20 years ago with a white paper they wrote, which was called The Myth of Managed Multitasking, in which they quantified that you will lose a minimum, not a maximum, a minimum of 30% just in the cognitive demobilization, remobilization associated with task switching. Again, when we talk about things like 30 to 40% time to market acceleration, 30 to 70% cost savings, and people are shocked to hear those types of numbers, and yet I will pick up a 30% performance improvement with this one action alone. If you do not have enough people to dedicate your people to projects, you definitely don't have enough people to thrash them. Because I will do more with six people who are dedicated to a project than you'll do with nine people that you're thrashing around multiple projects themselves. Just so you know, subsequent to that Microsoft study, there have been about 100 other studies, all of which found the exact same thing. And if anybody here is interested in uh, learning more about them, they're uh, quantified quite nicely in a book called Slack the fallacy of total efficiency. Um, an average of 16 hours per week are just wasted, right? Uh, they're wasted on uh, unclear objectives. We don't know exactly what we should be working on, uh, poor team communication, uh, and ineffective meetings. So let's deep dive into a few of these things. Uh, step one is to work on the right things. Um, you know, we have a lot of organizations that come to us and they say, Mark, we'd really like to work with you because we'd like to learn how to be more efficient. And I will tell them, do not worry about being more efficient until you have first figured out how to be more effective. You know, I would much rather have a very inefficient development team that was always working on the right thing than a very efficient development team that thrashed around in this rudderless environment. Step one is always to work on the right thing. Now, the way that we do that under an agile approach is we've got a dedicated role that that's their full-time job, right? That's called the product owner. Now, notice that I said that they are a dedicated product owner. And the reason that it's so critical that they're dedicated is because this is a person who is going to be establishing long-term, mid-term, and immediate direction for the team itself. Under an agile approach, we're going to swap out documentation 
for access. And invariably, there are going to be thousands of questions that your development team is going to have, actually regardless to the number of documentations uh, that you happen to have, right? Um, and we want the customer representative to answer those questions and to set that direction. And then all throughout the project itself, they're actually being opportunistic. When you think about an agile approach, it's all about early validated learnings, right? Um, rather than doing this, uh, you know, faith-based development on, oh, well, my idea is exactly what the marketplace is going for. You're constantly inspecting and adapting. And so, whereas under a traditional approach, uh, change was a very bad thing, uh, and that is because of a concept called scope creep, under an agile approach, uh, change is going to be embraced because I don't have the concept of scope creep. You see, traditionally, because we worked in documentation, uh, what we would do is uh, the business would come up with uh, a business idea. They would document that business idea. And then later in the process, when they figured out what they actually wanted, they would go back and they would say, um, the thing that I wrote earlier, yeah, this is what I mean by that, right? And the reason that they can do that is because, well, words can be interpreted a hundred different ways. So how do you know what I meant when I wrote that eight months ago type of a thing? Under an agile approach, we're not going to try to force people to validate what they had said originally. As soon as we realize that there is something different than our understanding is that the marketplace wants, we're going to be able to get those changes and incorporate them into the project itself. Oh, by the way, whereas under a traditional model, if you came up under a new idea, you were going to have to justify that new idea. Under an agile approach, just by the fact that it is a priority, that new idea is automatically going to be funded. Do you want to, want, want to know what might not be funded? Our lowest priority item. And so we've got this very Darwinistic product development cycle here where the most important ideas are always funded, and it's our lowest priority items that need to struggle. Oh, by the way, I also don't have the concept of scope creep. And the reason why is what I meant by something I wrote, that's fuzzy, right? I can interpret that a lot of different ways. I can stuff a lot of things into it. But under an agile approach, you're going to run out of money. And the day that you run out of money, it's not fuzzy at all. And so for those organizations that are interested in things such as scope control, who would actually love an agile approach because it's under an agile approach that I've got a solid line of demarcation. Reduce interruptions. Um, and there are a few ways that uh, we like to uh, reduce interruptions. The first one starts at the personal level, right? Uh, and these are interruptions such as uh, the email flash that happens every time you've got a new spam message, the uh, phone that vibrates because Aunt Martha uploaded a new cat video to Facebook, you know, all the critical things that are happening in your life. And the way that uh, we deal with those things is through discipline, right? Uh, we call it turn off, uh, tune in type of, a, type of a thing. And then many times what we advocate to our clients is that they run these Pomodoro techniques. Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with Pomodoro, Pomodoro is basically running sprints in your personal life for uh, time management. So uh, you've got a priority list. You take your highest priority item. Uh, you're going to work on it for a cycle. Uh, and usually the uh, cycle is about 25 minutes. Uh, then you're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, then you'll do another Pomodoro. You'll work on the same item for 25 minutes, and you'll take a five-minute break. After four Pomodoros, you take a longer break, 15, 30 minutes, just to sort of clear your head. You keep working on the same item until you get that item done. Um, and what Pomodoro allows for is it allows to ensure that every day you actually achieve something. You know, in many parts of our lives, what we do is we do a little bit of everything. All throughout the day, we just sort of, you know, thrashing around, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And at the end of the day, we haven't actually accomplished anything. What Pomodoro ensures and Pomodoro ensures that is at the end of the day, every day, you've uh, achieved something tangible. The next level is at the uh, team level, reducing team interruptions. And a lot of people say, well, team interruptions is inherent to an agile approach. And collaboration is inherent to an agile approach. But many times, we'll use physical indicators um, to tell people that, hey, I'm in the zone. Please don't come and interrupt me. Uh, one of the things that we often do is we'll give our teams these noise-canceling headsets. Um, and then oftentimes, the team will have uh, little uh, team agreements, such as if somebody's got their headset on, that's a do not disturb sign. Don't, don't even go up to that person. Now, you can't come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, put on your headset, and for eight hours, just leave your headset on, right? You need to have collaboration hours. We oftentimes call them office hours, uh, times when the team knows that they can collaborate with you. But what these physical indicators allow is they allow people to get into the zone and stay into the zone uh, for much longer periods of time. 
Um, and then there are external interruptions. Uh, now, external interruptions, the way that we handle those things is usually for, through somebody who is a dedicated protector of the team. Now, under a scrum model, that's called a scrum master. Again, notice that I said that they are a dedicated person. And the reason that they're a dedicated person is, well, Interruptions, they don't happen from the organization Tuesday at 10 a.m. and then again Thursday at 3 p.m., right? They happen all day, every day. Um, this dedicated scrum master is not only going to be a protector from the team, but they also as a lubricant for the uh, scrum engine. They're the ones that sort of clear the path to ensure that the team is moving in the fastest, most unfettered way possible. The reason that it's so important to have this dedicated scrum master is that one of the things that we found is that most external interruptions, they actually come from above the team hierarchically, right? And so having this separation between uh, the person who's being interrupted and the person who's protecting them is actually very important from a career sustaining perspective. Oftentimes, we also do things such as uh, quiet hours. So we'll work with organizations and they'll say, well, you know, we can't really have headsets on and, and it's really difficult for us to uh, protect the team all the time. Well, then we just set organizational expectations and we'll do things such as, all right, from the minute that the team comes in until lunch, those are quiet hours. There aren't going to be any meetings. Um, nobody's responding to your email. Uh, when you call us, it's going to go right to voicemail, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and then in the afternoon, the team makes themselves available to the organization and uh, all of the drama that's happening in the organization itself. But again, during the freshest part of the day, uh, we know that the team is being able to focus on product development. Uh, reduce thrashing, and this is what I was saying before. If you don't have enough people uh, to be able to dedicate, you definitely don't have enough people to uh, thrash your team members around. Uh, do keep that in mind. For each project, by the way, that a person is thrashing to, they will reduce their effectiveness that much more. Improve communication, co-locate your teams. You know, one of the things that we happen to know through research is that about 58% of communication congruency, the connection between what I said and what I meant, is conveyed through kinetics body language. About 35% of communication congruency is culturally specific voice tonality. For those of you who have a teenager, you probably understand this, right? The same word said differently, it has a completely different meaning. And as little as 7% are the uh, words themselves. Words are ripe for misunderstanding. Um, and you don't need to be a statistician to have ever experienced this. Have any of you ever read a book and then subsequently gone to a movie that was based on the book? Were the characters in the movie exactly how you had envisioned them in your head? Never. And the reason why is because, well, words can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Uh, invest in personal relationships. And actually, this has been uh, you know, uh, demonstrated time and time again. And in fact, the uh, number one IT organization in London did an experiment in 2011 in which they forbid their internal people from sending internal emails. Now, they're lucky. They were co-located into a single building, and they did it for efficiency gain. Uh, and what they found at the end of the year was that they achieved the efficiency gain that they were hoping to be able to achieve by people communicating uh, directly with each other. Now, one of the things that they were not expecting that they also found is that when they did their end of year employee satisfaction results, that employee satisfaction was much, much higher. And the reason that the employees we were giving for their satisfaction increased so much was uh, connectedness. They used the word connectedness. You know, I send you an email. You're just a person I'm sending an email to. Uh, I come and I sit with you face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, I go to talk to you about a work issue, and I say, oh, your kids play soccer? My kids play soccer. See, we now have something in common, right? Uh, it's connectedness. The other thing that they found is that um, People in general were just much nicer. Uh, has anybody here ever met a uh, person in a social event? They seem very, very nice. And then a couple of weeks go by and you get this scathing email from them and you go, well, clearly this cannot be the same person. No, no, it's the same person. They've just got this separation that they're not all, uh, holding personal responsibility for their actions anymore. But when you communicate face to face, you need to, right? And so what they found is that people in general are just a lot more courteous because they were actually having to sit down with those people face to face. And so the way they even framed issues was different. Um, good technology matters, right? If you're going to uh, uh, communicate, you're going to have to uh, invest in uh, good technology if you've got remote teams. And so a lot of free uh, technology that's out there, uh, but the truth is investing in technology is going to save you in the long run. Now, if you want to know what is the worst way to the best way to communicate, the good news is that the worst way is also the most popular, uh, and that is email. 
Uh, it's asynchronous. It's words only. Um, it's terrible. In fact, uh, the inventors of email actually went on record a few years ago, and they said, had we known the damage we were doing to the global economy, we would have never released it. Um, better than email is instant message or text. And the reason why is you basically accelerate the cycle. So uh, I can offend you in real time and I can apologize in real time, right? So the cycle itself actually gets accelerated. Um, better than instant message or text is phone. Uh, and the reason why is because, well, now you can actually start picking up on some voice tonality. And this is why sometimes when you're talking to a significant other, they'll go, is something bothering you, right? They're picking up on your voice tonality. Um, better than phone is video because at least you can start picking up on some body kinetics uh, with video. And again, like I said, um, investing in good technology makes uh, a big difference. But nothing, absolutely nothing, can compare to face-to-face -face communication. Content, tonality, and kinetics unified. It is my goal to get you to face-to-face -to -face communication. It is my job to move you as far up that maturity model as I possibly can. Reduce meetings. Um, and one of the best ways to reduce meetings is simply to stand. You know, one of the things that's pretty popular uh, under an agile approach is a, a, a meeting or a ceremony, uh, which is called a, a daily scrum. And many times people colloquially refer to it as the daily stand up because of this tradition of do it while it's standing. Uh, the reason that we do it while uh, standing is because it's a short meeting. You're going to get a maximum of 15 minutes for the meeting itself. And we know that meetings that are done standing are 34% shorter than. And meetings that are done seated. I'm sure that you've all been into these meetings, right? People go in, they get comfortable, they get their nice hot coffee, maybe a donut or something. This is somebody who's going to pontificate, right? Uh, you know, I want those meetings to be uh, standing up, get to the point, and get back to work. Uh, if you do have to have meetings that you just simply can't avoid, do them between 1 and 3 p.m., and the reason why is we happen to know that you're going to be your least productive between 1, 3 p.m. anyways, right? It's post-lunch. Uh, you know, all of the blood uh, goes down to your stomach for digestion. Uh, and the truth is it's not the best time for productivity. So if you're going to have to be in a meeting in which you play on your BlackBerry for 59 minutes, contribute for 30 seconds, grab a donut and leave, do it between 1 and 3 p.m. Here are a few resources that are available to you couple of websites, uh, a few books. Uh, this is a book that I wrote uh, called Agile Project Management for Dummies. Uh, I'm releasing another one in November, which is called Scrum for Dummies, in which I look about how to use the Scrum framework in every part of your life, how to use it for ERP systems, how to use it for government work, how to use it to find love. Um, you know, a lot of times people think that a Scrum model is an IT framework. It's not. It's an efficiency framework. How do I get validated learnings much, much earlier? I appreciate you spending some time with us. Hopefully the video has been valuable for you. If you'd like additional information, please visit us on our website, platinumedge.com. Uh, there we've got not only additional videos, but an extensive blog presence, as well as templates associated with the type of work that we do. And for those organizations that are interested in either being formally trained in agile techniques or in transforming your organization for higher efficiency, please reach out to us. We'd love to work with you. Have a great day.